Hearing from the candidates tonight will help you decide who you wanna be your next state senator. And the primary, excuse me, I just got a message. <laughs> the, um, the primary election will take place on Tuesday, September 6th, which is the day after Labor Day. Thank you, Bill Galvin. Um, tonight, Spanish interpreting is available. To turn it on, click on the world icon at the bottom of the screen and select Spanish as your language. If you are in an app or on a phone or on a tablet, click on the three dots and select language in the menu. If you are on a web browser or a Chromebook, unfortunately, you cannot listen to the interpretation. We will also be using closed caption. We, wish, we want to thank tonight's interpreters, Melissa Lynch and Juan Savada. And this forum is also being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. We ask the audience to be respectful when posting in chat. Please do not engage in harassing, discriminatory, and intimidating behavior that stifles debate and constructive dialogue. Before we begin, I want to tell you a little bit about J Jamaica Plain Progressives. Since 2009, JPP has been working to build a progressive voice in our community and organize for change in Boston, Massachusetts, and nationwide. We conduct candidate forums and organize to support progressive candidates at all levels of government, from city council to president. In addition, we hold educational forums and advocate for progressive change in our state on issues such as criminal justice reform, equitable education funding, safe communities for immigrants, progressive revenue, and transparency in government. We are the clipboard holders, door knockers, and question askers for progressive values in our community. Tonight, we have several co-sponsors who will take a few moments to tell you about their organizations. First up is Anthony Crossan, Vice President of the Boston Chapter of the NAACP. Anthony? Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, good evening. My name is Anthony Crossan, Second Vice President of the NAACP Boston Branch. And on behalf of the branch, our executive committee and a large group of uh, very committed volunteers, we welcome you to the Candidates Forum uh, for the Second Suffolk Senate. I want to thank uh, JP Progressives uh, for hosting this forum and all who join, um, hoping to make a more informed decision at the polls uh, based on what you hear over the next hour or so. Um, special thanks also to our moderators who will facilitate, uh, push, and press um, on some of the very important issues to get the answers that we so desperately need. Uh, tonight, we have a chance to uh, learn the heart behind the candidates, the values that govern their work, the ideas and the priorities that distinguish one from the other. Tonight, we, we better understand the positions on topics that are necessary, urgent, and requiring a faithful leadership. Um, this is an important election as it affects youth fighting for equity in classrooms and seniors hoping for more uh, from a healthcare system, a black and brown community pushing through the walls and beyond ceilings that beam with injustice. That's really the heart of the NAACP. Um, to look within our community, our black and brown community, as well as everyone who fights for justice and come along to uh, alongside to eradicate uh, racial practices that we see um, that often affect the people that we may not see. Um, thank you to everyone who will speak tonight, everyone who attended tonight, and all who will vote soon. I now would like to turn it over to Vanessa Snow. Good evening. My name is Vanessa Snow. Uh, I'm a member of Mi Gente, um, as well as a member of Right to the City Vote Steering Committee. And we're honored, as always, to be um, hosting this forum with our, our coalition partners, JP Progressives and AACP. And, um, you know, we're, we're uh, uh, all of us are, are a coalition of, of organizers and activists who, you know, who do the work outside of the election process. And, and so, um, you know, for us, it's important, no matter, no matter who's elected, um, that the candidates are able to get a sense of what are the issues that we're going to be mobilizing uh, and, and, and pushing them on um, as, they, as, uh, as they get elected into, into office. And so I'm excited to learn more about the candidates and hopefully, especially um, how they will co-govern with all of the groups that are here. 
Um, so thank you for your time, candidates. Thank you, Vanessa. And we are very grateful for tonight's moderator, Soraya Wintersmith, political reporter for GBH, and Yawo Miller, the senior editor for the Bay State Banner. And I think we are ready to begin. Uh, Soraya, are you ready? Soraya is in the house, right? I am here. I am oh, good. Here. <laughs> All right, everyone can hear me? We should get started. All right, so hello and good evening and welcome again to the JP Progressives Forum with candidates for the second Suffolk Senate seat. We've got a lot to get through with the four candidates tonight. The candidates are Minyard Culpepper, Senior Pastor of Pleasant Hill Missionary Baptist Church, Representative Nika Aligardo, the 15th Suffolk House seat, Representative Liz Miranda of the 5th Suffolk House seat, and former state Senator Diane Wilkerson, who previously represented the second Suffolk. Uh, just as a bit of a roadmap, we'll start with opening statements, which everyone will have two minutes for. After that, we'll move on to a mix of in-depth questions that candidates will have 90 seconds to answer and lightning round questions. And candidates, you should use a green check mark or a red X icon within Zoom to indicate yes or no. If you're struggling, then I suppose you can just say it because we want those to move pretty quickly. Um, candidates, you should also beware. The pandemic has made the JP progressives fans of the mute button. So once you hit your time limit, you'll have about five seconds before someone closes your mic to keep the conversation moving. In terms of who answers questions, we'll start in reverse alphabetical order and rotate forward. That means we're beginning tonight with former Senator Diane Wilkerson yeah, we'll take it away. Um, so uh, I think, was I supposed to do the district lines first? Or... Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so as most of you are probably aware, the second Suffolk district has changed its boundaries uh, from the, those lines that were set 10 years ago. Um, it's lost most of the South End it used to go to Berkeley Street, and now it goes uh, as far as Mass Ave. Still includes Mission Hill, but um, and Hyde Square, but has given up Pondside and uh, the Moss Hill sections of Jamaica Plain. Um, as you can see in the map on the right, it follows Hyde Park Avenue all the way down into Reedville, and then follows in the Pondsit River, sort of coming up from the bottom to just shy of Lower Mills. Um, and uh, the new district is, I think, 32% white, 31% um, African American, 26% Latino, and 8% Asian. Um, as you, and you can see here that it includes all of Ward 11, all of Ward 12, all of Ward 14, um, uh, as well as many precincts in 18 and 19. Um, so it's been redrawn to increase the minority uh, or people of color. Um, percentages and it's a majority people of color district, um, which is the way the district was originally drawn. It was originally drawn to be a people of color district in which, um, uh, you know, a black person or more recently a Latina can be elected. Um, so um, yeah, it, it, new district, but uh, but I think everybody here um, is familiar with the heart of the district and the spirit of the district. So we're, um, you know, uh, um, pretty much, you know, it's it's really, it's changed like in terms of the boundaries, but it's the way it's always been uh, for the way most of us remember the district. Yeah, well, you have the first question. Okay, I'm sorry, I do have the first question. So we're gonna <laughs> start with, I'm sorry. We're gonna start with, with uh, Diane Wilkerson. Um, first question. How do you find the balance between the role of elected leaders in addressing the immediate needs of constituents versus the importance of focusing on impacting larger structural issues? No, yeah, oh, sorry to interrupt. I think we're going to start with um, with opening statements for two okay. minutes and ask folks to address their top three priorities. I'm, I'm sorry. So, okay, so starting with Diane, please, uh, your, your opening statement 
and then tell us what your first three priorities would be. Good evening, everyone. Um, and I thank you for the JPP progressives for hosting this important event this evening. I would say that the newly drawn second Suffolk district is rich in history, in culture, uh, diversity, and has some of the best that Boston has to offer. But we also see some of the worst. And I think we are a different place. We're a different, <laughs> we're a different district after COVID. And who represents us in this recovery post COVID and rebuild matters. We need to repair, uh, reverse, rebuild. And some of the consequences of those past several years are gonna take us several years to do so. The, the most vulnerable communities, and by that I mean especially Black and Latino uh, communities, lost big, children lost, single family women, heads of household lost, women lost, Black males lost, Latino men lost. Uh, and, and, and so we, we need someone who can deliver, who understands and writes, who understands and writes policy, who is able to get to 21, uh, votes and often difficult and sometimes controversial issues and an important measure of the ability to do so is what one's already done. And so I feel I, I'm prepared, approved, ready. And today I think begins the first opportunity for all of you to hear and compare the candidates. Um, JP was the base of the district for a long time. I've represented the community before, but there's so much more than JP to this conversation into the district. And I hope to have the opportunity to do so again. Who knows what's in store for us, you know, for women, and I said for the LGBTQ community, people of color. But if we take our cue from what's happening nationally, it certainly gives us some indication of what is to come. The stakes have never been higher. Who represents us matter. I'm ready. And I look forward to the opportunity for the discussion this evening. Thank you, Diane. Uh, next, we'll hear from Liz, uh, your opening statement and top three priorities. Good evening. I want to take a moment to thank JP Progressives and all of tonight's hosts, as well as Soraya Wintersmith and Yahoo Miller for moderating. I'm State Rep Liz Miranda from the 5th Suffolk District representing Roxbury and Dorchester. And I'm here tonight because I believe I'm the best candidate to lead as Senator of the 2nd Suffolk. I'm the daughter of a teen immigrant mom from Cabo Verde, who dropped out of Madison Park to be a cook in Boston hotels, where she still is today organizing as a local 26 member. I'm also the daughter of a black immigrant father who was incarcerated, then import, deported when I was 18 years old as I walked on the campus of Wellesley. And that pain of family separa separation has led me uh, in the mass house to file the Safe Communities Act, among other bills. I grew up in the Dudley Triangle and own a home there today. It's an EJ community that suffered everything from redlining, pollution, and disinvestment. And I saw firsthand how government left us behind, but we rose from the ashes. And I was a witness and participant in being able to see ordinary people do extraordinary things. That's where I learned organizing. That's where I learned coalition building. I'm a lifelong resident of the Second Suffolk. I went to the John D. O'Brien and I've been active for well over 20 years in my district. In 2017, when I lost my brother Michael to gun violence, it was a catalyst for me to run for office. And in the short three and a half years that I've been in office, I've not only delivered during a global health pandemic and racial awakening, but a housing and economic crisis. And I led in five different bills and pieces of legislation and brought millions of dollars to the district as a survivor of homicide and many other things. My agenda has been centered day one on equity and justice. And I've delivered on police reform, criminal justice reform, and birthing justice and jail-based voting where I helped to re-enfranchise eight to 10,000 incarcerated individuals. And I brought money to businesses from Nubian Square to Mattapan Square and I have a track record for delivering in this district and I wanna bring that lived experience and track record to the second Suffolk to deliver more on this progressive agenda. My top three priorities are of course, making sure we are well, centering health equity, ensuring that our communities are safe and healthy with environmental justice. And of course, because I've seen so many of my family members and friends displaced to focus on housing, not only home ownership, but also ensuring that the housing stock we have is safe and equitable for all. Next, we'll hear from Nika, 
um, your opening statement and top three priorities. JP Progressives, Yawu and Sureya, thank you for having us. Welcome to my fellow candidates. I wish that I could greet you in person in my home of Jamaica Plain, uh, but it's good to see all of you. I am known to many uh, in Jamaica Plain, uh, but not to all. Uh, many of you know that I have been a state representative, not only for the precincts that I represent, but for all of the neighborhoods of Jamaica Plain, Mission Hill and Rossendale. And I'm especially excited to add four additional beautiful neighborhoods to that number. The seven neighborhoods of the second Suffolk have a deep and a rich heritage of extraordinary leadership, of deep investment. And too often that investment has been stolen from us. The return on investment that is people of the second Suffolk is something that I've been working on delivering for three of those neighborhoods. We've brought in millions, yes. But more importantly than the money that we've brought in and the policies that we've pushed, we've built leadership. I'm a leader that builds leaders. I have 30 years of experience developing and training other leaders and bring that movement building ideology into how I do business in the state house. And that's why many of you on this call are not only my constituents, but you're my teachers. I wanna to continue to work with you. I wanna to continue to understand the issues that you have. And I wanna to continue to bring the leadership of Jamaica Plain not only to our little part, little corner of the district, but to all seven neighborhoods. My top three priorities are housing and ecological justice, which go together. There is no housing justice without climate justice, economic and entrepreneurial opportunity for all, and equitable education for all, which includes making sure that zero to five education is free and universal, and that post-secondary education is free and public as well. Race equity is a lens through which we're looking at all of these policies, and I look forward to talking about how. Thank you, Nika. And last, we'll hear from Minyard. Um, again, your opening statement and top three priorities. I would like to thank the JP Progressives for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Soraya Yahoo. Um, I was born in Boston, went to school in Boston, went to college in Boston. I was inspired from an early age by my parents and grandparents who were active in the civil rights movement in Boston. They were trailblazers. Their spirit of activism and fighting for justice was passed down for me. I'm a lawyer who followed the law and a minister who followed the Lord. This work has defined my entire life. As a young lawyer, I helped a friend fight City Hall to buy a boarded up housing at Grove Hall. That episode changed my life. Though he has passed, his daughters and his granddaughters still live in that house. I went to work on the subcommittee on housing in Congress as a chief of staff before eventually working for the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development as regional counsel for New England. While at HUD, I fought City Hall and the Boston Housing Authority to create a civil rights protection plan to ensure that the tenants had the right to a safe, sanitary, in decent housing that their rights were protected. I used to create the, an easier path for tenants to acquire home ownership through the demonstration disposition pro program and work to secure the $25 million in redevelopment money that re renovated that multifamily housing and HUD's inventory that were in desperate need of report, repair. In addition to my work at HUD, I have raised two sons who are both attorneys as well. I serve as senior pastor of the Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, the church that my grandfather founded and built, where I founded the Trotter Park Peace Program, an employment and mentorship program for young at-risk youth of color with Corey issues. And I spearheaded the six point peace plan aimed at ending the violence in our communities. I have fed my community in the tough times of the pandemic and led efforts to get everyone vaccinated. Uh, I would love to represent J JP in the State House and look forward to taking your questions. My three priorities are housing, uh, education justice, and the environment. I think that uh, there's no way that we can continue to live with the cost of housing rising the way they are and be able to uh, put all of our children to school in a way that's receive justice, equity, fairness, and education to make them the youth that we know they can be. Thank you. Thanks, Minier. Thank you all for your opening statements. And now we'll get into the questioning. 
Um, and we'll start again with, uh, with Diane. Um, again, the first question is, how do you find the balance between the role elected leaders play in addressing the immediate needs of constituents versus the importance of impacting larger structural issues? We're specifically interested in hearing um, what you're doing to help constituents bounce back, constituents and small businesses bounce back from the pandemic. She's, uh, this, Diane's muted. I think you're muted, Diane. Okay, stand by. All right. Got it. Got it. Um, so for me, the there isn't a distinction between um, facilitating that. That, that balance that you talk about, the, the, the structural issues are the, are the constituents issue. Where we got the policy we drafted came from issues that were brought to us from the constituents. For example, the racial and gender profiling bill we filed came from a series of meetings where we noticed at the end of the meetings, the sisters and the mothers and the daughters would come up to say, tell us stories about what was happening with their sons, the husbands, the uncles, and you know, the, so, so that, that was one and the same. I think often people think of campaigning as walking away from the work or you make this choice. To me, campaigning is doing the work. The structural issues are real. Um, we have spent, I have spent the last two years almost every single day uh, on the ground uh, fighting around issues of COVID, not just for our, the, in terms of health, but the economic issues. And you can see that all around you, both the as a founder of the Black Boston COVID-19 Coalition, it was our energy and the collaboration that grew to 500 people that grew that coalition from eight people in March of 2020 to over 500 now. We were responsible for moving Massachusetts from number 45 in the country in Black and Latino vaccinations in February 2021. And by April, we were at the top five. And we were, we've been speaking all over the country to talk to them about what we did on the ground. And we're still there, Washington Park Mall yesterday. The businesses are the same. I work with the Black Boston Hospitality Coalition, secured money for them. We were not successful in, a, in our ability to get monies from the state because that just didn't happen. And so I will leave for others to explain uh, that. But our uh, recovery and our Black businesses are critical. I worked with the city of Boston and and working with our restaurant owners, our bars, our club owners, and making sure they didn't lose their liquor licenses. They will tell you that. We were able to negotiate an incredible opportunity for them to waive the licenses because we, they, they, were, they were shuttered. They had no, no, no business and they were closed. And okay, we're at time. Sorry, um, so you'll get, um, you know, you get to the end of the, the, the time slot and then there's like a little bit of overtime and then the, the mic will cut off. Um, so uh, yeah, we will now go to, um, to Liz with the same question. How do you find the balance between the role of elected leaders in addressing the immediate needs of constituents versus the importance of focusing on impacting larger structural issues? I believe this is my strength actually as a lifelong community and youth organizer. People shouldn't have to choose when they vote for someone that someone is a legislative champion, someone that fights for progressive values or someone that is grassroots and in community. I've led with integrity, I've been responsive. I have two legislative aides because my district is incredibly busy as the most of color and one of the busiest and poorest in the entire Commonwealth. I opened a district office I led in community care as soon as COVID-19 happened because I knew government would fail. I was leading uh, from the beginning in community serving food, but also delivering PPE. But in the state house, I wrote two bills, cash assistance, direct cash assistance to people because I knew they needed money and to ensure that our small businesses uh, got the resources they need. And that's why I've won uh, over a million dollars in technical assistance, particularly for small BIPOC businesses and micro businesses. What's important here is that as a leader, it is both a privilege and a responsibility. People wanna see you in community, particularly this being the black Senate seat. People wanna know that you're on Beacon Hill fighting with 
and for them, but they also want to see you on the streets uh, of your community, making sure that you're hosting town halls and engaging them. And so I've not find the balance hard. It's a little exhausting uh, because you have to attend many community meetings and, and be in many uh, faith-based institutions, but I do believe that I'll continue this in the second suffix. Thank you, Liz. And uh, on to Nika. Thank you, y'all. Well, uh, well, first, don't work alone. Work in teams. Second, don't work in a silo. Work systemically. And third, don't rely on my own leadership. I rely on the leadership in the community, not just individual leaders, but groups and institutions as well. Uh, some examples of bringing the voice and the power of these institutions and these individuals into the district uh, or from the district into the state house. There are very many. Uh, but let's start with criminal justice reform. Uh, how do you play smart? We made a silo. That silo, uh, I'm sorry, we made a pilot. That pilot for vo jail-based voting in the second Suffolk, I wrote a, a bill for it, but we didn't wait for the bill to pass. The sheriff of Suffolk County and I, we got that done. And we brought that, we brought that data to the hearing that established the groundwork for the Voting Act and that established the groundwork for expanding that pilot and bringing ballot boxes inside. When we noticed that our kids were beating folks up for the first time, they were coming out of middle school and into high school, we brought them in, we brought them into the leadership. We used their stories and their leadership to help us get over a million dollars in resources for small businesses, where we then got 70 plus youth jobs to 35 different businesses. This is the way we do work in 15 Suffolk. This is the way we work. We organize, we energize, and we amplify your voices. We'll continue to do that throughout the district. And I've got so many more stories I look forward to sharing, but I think I'm out of time. Thank you, Nika. And on to Minyard. Um, and I just want to uh, interject here for a second. Uh, Ruben Cantor will be posting the questions um, in the chat. So if you're um, a candidate, you know, check out the chat so you can see the questions again. Um, uh, Minyard, uh, uh, please enter the question. Thank you, Yabu. I think one of the problems is that uh, there has to be an assessment of the institution and the structure that's causing the problems to keep the residents of the second Suffolk Center District from getting what they need. I think once you assess where the problems are, and many of the problems we talk about institutional and structural racism is what keeps a lot of what happens in the Suffolk second Suffolk that should. What we did when we, and taking your example with regard to COVID and the pandemic, what we did, we looked at what wasn't coming to the residents in the community. So we saw they weren't getting PPE. We saw they weren't getting testing. So what we did, we worked with one of the businesses, Westnet. Westnet provided early on when there weren't masks, they provided thousands of masks free to the COVID-19 clergy committee, the committee that I started that really began to deal with the COVID issue. The COVID-19 clergy committee took mass, boxes of mass, and we distributed them not just to the churches, but to the community that came to the churches to get the mass. We worked with the, the business to do that. We also were one of the first ones with regard to testing. If you remember, many folks in our community didn't wanna get tested. They didn't want to get the vaccination. What we did, the COVID-19 clergy committee, we got together, we met with Whittier Street, we did six uh, different groups that the doctors from Whittier sat with the pastors. They explained to them what the testing was all about. The pastors then went to Whittier Street themselves. We did the press conference so that the residents could see us getting the testing. We also did the same thing with vaccinations. When folks in our community didn't want to get vaccinated, what we did, we rolled up our sleeves, we worked with Whittier Street, we went down the Whittier Street, we got vaccinated, we did a press conference, we did some videos. So time. I'm sorry, Minya, you, you, you reached time. Our next question will start with Liz Miranda. The city of Boston has been wrestling with the issues of homelessness and substance misuse disorder, especially at the intersection of Mass Avenue and Melnia Cass Boulevard, which includes many individuals not from Boston. 
the Baker administration has mostly left the issue in the hands of the city of Boston. What do you see as the state's role in this issue and what strategies can the state pursue, pursue to make sure the burden for carrying, caring for vulnerable people is shared more evenly? You have 90 seconds. Well, first, the state that needs to understand that this is all of our children and all of our problem. Uh, what's been an issue at Mass and Cass, it's not only people who are homeless, but mentally ill, and there are people addicted to drugs, but there's also people returning back to society from our carceral system with no place to go. And I've been active in the Mass and Cass Task Force. I live about four blocks away uh, with Diane as well. Uh, and one thing that I've really focused on is making sure that we have low threshold housing. Uh, we secured $5 million in the state budget last year in FY 21 or 22 to ensure that folks could have a place to go while they're working on their recovery. i am also been a person that really believes in decriminalization of drugs. We've seen it work in other countries and other states where folks who are sick get help they're not sent to jail. And that's an important part of my tenant of not only making sure people have the housing and the beds. And here's the real deal. A lot of our cities and towns where these young people or elders are coming from do not want to build the type of housing and treatment centers in the bed and the beds in their community. And that's been part of the problem. And that's why they come to our community at Mass and Cass where there are four methadone clinics. There's this uh, world renowned Boston Medical Center to get the services. And now it's an open air drug market where people are not safe. There's been lots of crimes, sexual assaults, and we need to change that. So we need to get people into homes and into treatment and ensure that society is supportive of people going through the throes of addiction. Thank you. Nika, you are next. Talk about what you see as the state's role in the issue and what strategies do you think the state can pursue? Uh, thank you, Soraya. I come at this question from personal life experience, having grown up with eviction and addiction, uh, having moved 14 times as a child, then even in a better situation with regards to, to the health side as an adult, uh, my husband and I moved over 25 times. I've lived in six of the seven neighborhoods of the district as a result of housing ins insecurity myself. I come at the question also as a legislator who thinks systemically and who brings my lifelong history working on housing issues. I've run two statewide programs, uh, both uh, related to housing and uh, asset development. Uh, one of those became the national model for foreclosure prevention. And Chapa told me recently, some of the work we wrote back then is still used. I come at the issue as a district legislator as well. The Envision Hotel is one of the places where the mayor and I and many others are working on what it looks like to house people uh, who are homeless, experiencing homelessness, and have serious substance use disorder. And that's looked like walking the streets, talking to businesses and to the people who have substance use disorder to ask, what are your needs and how can we help? What we've seen is uh, initially there were a lot of problems, but we've solved them together on my last walkthrough. Uh, the business owners who were complaining said these are members of our community and we're there to be with them. And with regards to uh, the state, we have to think both systemically and uh, in the short term. So I did get $100,000 with Justice for Housing uh, and uh, for housing people returning from incarceration and have worked on a bill that does, uh, I'm stopping. I'll talk about that bill later. <laughs> Good on you for keeping track of time. Minyard, you are next. You gotta unmute yourself. Thanks, you Soraya. I, I think it's important that we look at uh, how that happened. And if you remember, it really started out with most of the folks that were at the uh, Boston City Hospital, a homeless shelter. It grew and it grew and it grew and it grew to the encampments outside. One of the interesting things that uh, I think we have to do as a state, we have to look at what other states have done. And if you look at Los Angeles, Los Angeles started out with a skid row with those encampments the same way we did in Boston. But what they did was they had wraparound services that met the folks where they were in those encampments. Not only did they have the wraparound services that met with those folks that worked with them on a 24 seven basis, they built a development for women with children right across the street from where the skid row and the encampments were. And I don't think we can run from the problem. I think we have to 
deal with it right where it is. If it means building houses right across from the encampments, the way they did in Los Angeles. And the amazing thing about the way they did it in Los Angeles, they took the encampments, they took the women and the children that were on the streets. They built that housing and they used the first floor, if you ever go and see it, we went through it at HUD, you'll see that they walked right across the street. They now live in that development across the street with the same services that they had on the street with them. We need to meet them where they are and stop running from the problem. We go there as faith-based leaders on a weekly basis and we meet them where they are. And I think once we begin to meet them where they are as a state with the resources they'll need, then we'll really begin to deal with the issue. Thank you. Our next set of questions is going to be specific to each candidate. You guys will still have, oh, I'm sorry. We did not hear from Diane. Go ahead. It was nice not to be first. <laughs> uh, so I think the question was, what is the state? Uh, what can the state do? Um, so here, here's the bottom line. The Baker administration, has walked away, taken no responsibility, walks in every once in a while, makes an announcement. It is a mess if we're talking about mass and cass, right? It's a mess. And it is a mess with different elected officials pointing fingers about who's responsible. But the bottom line is that there's some of us who have to live. You heard Rep Miranda say, we live around the corner. Um, you can't, our children can't play in the park because they're dodging needles. The, the human condition there is unspeakable. And one of the things that Senator Travellini, the President Travellini did when I was in the Senate is I went to him and I said, look, I get calls from black people all over the state. And if I'm gonna be responsible for black people all over the state, then we're gonna have to get more resources. And that's what we did in our budget. This is the same issue. There's a reason people come. I'm not looking to send them away. But we've got to do a better job of holding the state responsible for taking care of a, of, a, of a human condition where three quarters of the people there do not live in Boston. And our children, our families are suffering miserably because we are losing business, changing their whole comings and goings because it is an unsafe place to be. And it's, it's just, it's unacceptable and we need to deal with it. Excellent, thank you. Our next set of questions will be specific to each candidate. Candidates, you will still have 90 seconds to respond, beginning with Nika. You have on occasion taken strong stands against House and Senate leadership. How effective do you think you'll be at getting things done in the Senate, a body where legislation is controlled by people in leadership positions? The stances that I've taken against uh, are right alongside the stances that I've taken for, and I've developed a reputation in the House and in the Senate among senators as well as being an honest straight shooter of integrity who speaks to you before I go to anyone public. Uh, the Speaker of the House himself told me, you know, if you get over to Senate, uh, honestly, he said when, but, you know, I want you to keep having these talks with me because they're very important. And those talks have been hard core uh, challenges on the way that he's taught people, the way that he's treated people, the way that he's led, but also lifting up the things that I've seen him do well. The same way that I did with the kids that are shooters and are now working in copper industry and other jobs that we got them through some of that money and the money that was added to it and invested by those that we partnered with. The same way that I approach leadership in every person. It's about uh, recognizing your strengths and, and, and helping you see the strengths of the others around you. That's how we got low income education funding with the unanimous vote. I was responsible for bringing along the recalcitrant Republican and conservative voters. I was, I was deployed as the delegate to convince them of what poverty looks like. Uh, I was the person that was deployed to convince many leaders to leave, to depart with uh, Speaker Mariano and stand with us on election day registration. We didn't win that vote, but we got 62 people to stand with us. That's the kind of movement building that's not only inspiring in our neighborhoods, it's also inspiring to my colleagues. Yeah, we gotta unmute yourself. 
Sorry, now I'll, I'll direct a question to Minyard now that I'm unmuted. Uh, Minyard, you're the only candidate in this race who has not yet held elected office. Uh, what would you say to voters who question your qualifications against those of the other three candidates? I would say that's a that's a big plus for me. That's an advantage. I come to this office without making any deals, any commitments. I don't sit on the floor of the house and uh, have to make the kind of decisions that Nika is talking about. I come to this with a new voice, new leadership. I come to this having been a chief of staff for a congresswoman on Capitol Hill. Uh, I not only ran the Senate, the congressional office in Washington, but I ran the district office. I come with legislative experience. I come with the experience of being the regional council for HUD for 27 years, knowing how to put legislation together, together to affect the residents that live in this city. And so I'm ready for this Senate seat. Uh, and I come to it uh, being, uh, Shirley Chisholm taught me, and I worked with her for years to be unbought and unbossed. And I'm coming to this position, I'm unbought and I'm unbossed, and I'm listening to the residents, and I will fight for the residents of the second Suffolk district, not just for housing, but I'll deal with the wealth inequality. I'll deal with youth violence. I'll deal with the families in need. We're doing it now. We give out, we still give out boxes of food every two weeks. The pandemic is not over and folks are still struggling. It's not as if they're not struggling. Folks are still struggling. We have a line out of the church. Every two weeks, folks come to get food. I will fight for them on Capitol Hill and I am unbought and unbossed. Great, thank you. Our next question is for Diane. Many would say you are pleading guilty to public corruption charges breached public trust. How are you planning to restore that public trust with people in the second Suffolk district? Well, I would say this, um, one, convening a community of people in 2015, when Boston was applying to, to host the Olympics, and there was a concern that the black community wouldn't have a role, wouldn't get any benefit. It was I who pulled the businesses, the black and Latino businesses together and, and created what we call freeze frame. Many people treat the, the news about $8 a family for um, assets as if it's new. It came from a, a study in 2015 that we presented at Grove Hall. How I would do it would be to create um, the business now that we all talk about called BECMA. How I would do it is to create the work of, um, of the Black Boston COVID-19 Coalition, 80,000, 80,000 uh, uh, the well, wellness visits, almost 200,000 gift cards, food, all the things. So nobody is asking me on the day, on the street day to day about that. And I think how you restore it is you just live, you work, you do the work. I've been doing it for 10 years, will continue. I never stop because that's part, that's who I am. It's in my heart and I don't need permission to do it. There, there are things you can do in and out of public office. And so I'll keep moving. I'm gonna keep talking about the things that we that, that are important to us. And I am more than willing, like I said, I have no secrets. My record's on the table. Anybody have questions, I'll talk about it. The voters are gonna decide it and I'm very comfortable with that proposition. Thank you, Diane. And Liz, um, you have in the past had social media posts that have used insensitive language how would you res respond to criticism of those statements? I've apologized for those statements um, that were done 10 to 12 years ago, and that's not who I am today. I've engaged with my public, my public very positively, and I've always been a partner and a friend to the communities, uh, the LGBTQIA community, as well as my homegrown community. I do not believe in policing hood vernacular. And if I use some of that hood vernacular when I was in my late 20s, I am not that woman today. None of us are our worst mistake. None of us are the worst thing that's happened to us. None of us are the worst thing we've done. I believe in grace and redemption for all people because, because this community, to be quite honest, is full of people who deserved a second chance. And that's something that I believe in and I have fought for and I just want to say to everyone tonight that the people of the second Suffolk this being in a majority black district all the way from Roxbury through Mattapan to Hyde Park are looking for people that will lead from their heart and lead with love not just on Beacon Hill. 
Thank you, Liz. Okay, we're going to go into rapid. Right. Okay. Yeah, we're going to go into rapid fire questions next, and uh, the order will be um, Diane, Liz, and then Nika. Uh, Nika and then Minyard. Um, first question: Do you support uh, legislation to enact a single payer healthcare system in Massachusetts, which would guarantee health insurance as a right? Diane. Yes. You want more than no. that? Was this is no, yes or no? no? Just, I'm sorry, just rapid fire. Liz, yes or no? Yes. Uh, Nika, yes or no? Yes. And Minyard, yes or no? Yes. Uh, next rapid fire question. Do you support requiring health insurance plans to cover all pregnancy care, including abortion care, without any kind of cost sharing? Yes or no? Uh, Diane? Yes, absolutely. Liz? Yes. Nika? Yes. Minyard? Yes. Okay. Third rapid fire question. Do you support a common start coalition, the, the common start coalition proposal to establish a robust system of high quality, affordable, early education and care for children from birth through age five, as well as after and out of school time for children ages five to 12, and for children with special needs through age 15? Yes or no? Diane? Yes. Liz? Yes, it started in my district. Nika? Yes. And Minyard? Yes. Thank you. Well done, nice and quick. Okay. <laughs> we'll start the next question with Liz. We are in the midst of yet another in a series of housing crises. What are your priorities to address this crisis, both in terms of rent control or rent stabilization? as well as home ownership. Mm -hmm. And what are you suggesting to prevent further displacement of residents in the second Suffolk district? Thank you, that's a really great question because housing is one of the major issues in the entire city of Boston. Uh, the rent's too damn high, but also there's a lack of ability to buy a home. I've seen many of my friends and family members move to the South Shore and further out to New Bedford and Fall River and Taunton because they could not afford, even with a good paying job, to buy a home in the neighborhood that they love. The problem with housing is we have to do multiple things at the same time. I do agree with rent stabilization, the right to counsel, eviction ceiling, uh, but we also have to ensure that the housing stock we currently have is also safe and affordable. There's so many people that live in subsidized housing or in our public housing along the Blue Halav corridor, for example, and they're living in places unfit for humans just down the street from many of the people who are living in JP tonight. And so for me, it's important that we think about everyone. Housing is a right and should be available to everyone. If you're returning back from society, and particularly if you're justice involved, you deserve a place to live that's affordable to you in the city that you love. But for folks that are trying to buy a home, you also want to be able to buy a home in our community. If you live anywhere in the inner city of Boston, you know that gentrification has put a chokehold on our communities. It is violent. Uh, and we have to address that because many of our communities look uh, do not look recognizable to many of the people in the uh, in our city. And so, if we're working on things and legislation that is all about building home ownership, uh, that's not going to deal with the issue. We have to ensure that we're doing multiple things at the same time. Thank you, Nika. You're next. Your priorities to address this housing crisis in terms of rent control or rent stabilization, home ownership and displacement prevention? Uh, one of the challenges that I noticed about the legislature and how we approach housing is we, is we do do it in piecemeal. So we have a lot of different bills, but there hasn't been a plan until recently to think about how to actually do housing for all. In fact, the goal expressly stated to me by MACDC when I came in is we need to get from four out of five people who need affordable housing and have it to uh, three out of four. No, it has to be four out of four, five out of five. And the way we do that is we look at the bills and how they work together in four key areas, not only tenant protection, uh, but also generating revenue. We've also been looking at supply, a third issue. And the fourth that I brought to the table is expanding our conception of public housing, moving away from a charity model to a model that includes building generational wealth. 
I have those in each of these areas, but I also co-sponsor a number of those in each of these areas. Uh, I call it the four pillars of the table that holds up affordable housing for all. And it's looking at um, ways that we can continue to partner, but we leave a lot of uh, resources on the table right now. And so some people in this Zoom actually have helped me do the research where we found that there are uh, there's almost $8 billion of state owned land that could be generate used to generate cash capital or development for affordable housing that has not been tapped. If we don't think more creatively about this, we're not going to solve the problem. And so uh, I've already got bills. I'm on the housing committee. Uh, and and not only am I knowledgeable about this, but so is my so is my district. And so I really look forward to uh, continue to execute on some of the stuff we've already done. Thank you. Minyard, you are next. Thank Your you. Priorities for addressing rent control, rent stabilization, home ownership, and displacement prevention. Thank you. I have dedicated my entire life to fighting housing justice. I believe that housing is not a privilege, but housing is a right. So I think one of the things, the first thing we need to do is we need to stabilize rents across the board. I think we need to end bias and redlining in the housing market. And if you look at the study that the Boston Foundation did with Suffolk University Law School, one of the things that they found was that Section 8 recipients, folks with Section 8 are being discriminated in a way that causes them to move to Brockton and Taunton because they can't find housing there with the Section 8 because of discrimination. I think we need to make uh, capital more accessible to those that have been shot, shut out of the mortgage market so that they can now buy housing. I think if you look at the history of housing in this country, I think if you look at how wealth was created years ago in the early 1900s, it was created because mortgages were given to white families and mortgages weren't given to black families. We even find that HUD did the same thing. So I think we have to look at what has happened. We have begun to propose solutions that will make mortgages available to those that have been denied. If you look at credit reports, play a big role in who gets a mortgage and who doesn't get a mortgage. And I think we need to start dealing with how we assess who gets a mortgage and who doesn't get a mortgage. And I think we need to stop the practice of using credit reports to deny mortgages to those who are income eligible to receive a mortgage. Thank you. And Diane, your priorities for addressing our current housing crisis. One of my favorite and I think most exciting topics when I think that we're dealing with this in large measure completely wrong, when we talk about housing being our issue, it's really money being our issue. We have had stagnated uh, salaries for the in, for incomes for the majority of the Black and Latino families in the second sub district. They're not able to even compete in a housing market. 75% of the rental housing in Roxbury is low income and subsidized. Those folks are never going to be able to compete for the $600,000 condo being built across the street. We have to deal with that. The second is housing, affordable housing, is not a response or an answer to um, wealth development, wealth creation. We keep trying to treat this as if they're the same. We've been working in cycles, and we have to stop the cycle. Our focus ought to be on income. I have a guaranteed income plan that would, in my opinion, put money directly in people's pockets so that they could address the issue of housing. Uh, our building more affordable housing has continued to make white people wealthy. It does nothing to change the income of the people who we put to live there. Rent stabilization uh, is certainly, we had rent control disappeared in Boston because Boston made it go away. It was a Boston home rule petition. And so if we want to turn that around, it should happen in Boston. And so we need to do work to do that. I think it is an important task whose time has come. We can be, we need to reinstate rent control. And I also think we need to do some transformational things around home ownership. I'm gonna be rolling out a plan on that in my part of my platform. So thank you. There's so much more I can say. Okay. Thank you, Diane. And moving on to rapid fire questions. I'm gonna ask five in this round. I will, um, I will just say the question once and then and then call your name. The order this time will be Nika, Minyard, Diane, and then Liz. Um, first question, do you support the fair share amendment, also known as the millionaire's tax, which yes. would raise income on on uh, raise the uh, income tax on income over one million dollars? Uh, Nika. 
Yes. Minyard. Yes. Diane. Yes. And Liz. Yes. Okay. Um, second question. Uh, do you support eliminating the subminimum wage for tipped workers, also known as the one fair wage approach? Yes. So, uh, Nika, then Minyard. Yes. Diane. Yes. And Liz. Absolutely. Uh, next question. Do you support making public transit in the Commonwealth fair free? Nika. Yes. Minyard. Yes. Diane. Yes. And Liz. Yes. Okay. Uh, next question. Would you support the legalization of safe consumption sites as part of a harm reduction approach to the opioid crisis? Yes. Um, Nika and uh, Minyard. Yes. Diane. Yes. Liz. Yes. Um, last question. Uh, are you for or against, I'm asking for, for or against the ballot question that would classify gig workers as independent contractors? Um, Nika. Against. Minyard. Against. Diane. Against. Liz. Against. Thank you. Oh boy, we are gonna have to dig for some differences here. <laughs> <laughs> the next question will begin with Minyard. What's your perspective on the issue of the state's potential takeover of Boston public schools? If you're opposed, what are you doing right now to help prevent the state from putting the Boston public schools into receivership? If you're supportive, how do you propose addressing the crisis facing our city school system? You have 90 seconds. Shabari, thank you for that question. Uh, and as a father of, uh, who has raised two boys in the city of Boston, I believe every child deserves the best ed education possible, and that is not happening in our present schools. This is not something that we can change, but something we must change. I am 100% opposed to receivership in the city of Boston. If you look at what's happened with receivership around the state, if you look at a Lawrence, when Lawrence went into receivership, Lawrence is no better off today than it was when it first went into receivership. One of the things that happened when Lawrence went into receivership and one of the things that the experts have said will take place when schools go into receivership, it becomes a takeover and the stakeholders lose their involvement in the schools. In other words, the state takes it over, the parents don't have the say that they have now, and they lose their stakeholder and their ability to have an impact on what happens in the school. And so I'm 100% against receivership. I think what happened in the schools where receivership have been taken over, there was high staff turnover. There was, when you look at the difference in the teachers staying, teachers began to leave and parents were cut out of the decision-making process. So I think that uh, the takeover, the receivership of the Boston Public Schools is a big mistake. And I think we've been working with clergy, we've been meeting with clergy, and we expect to have a press conference and make a statement real soon in opposition to the state taking over the Boston Public Schools. Bit of news there, thank you for that. <laughs> Diane? Uh, I would say, <laughs> yeah, I would say that then you better hurry up because it's happening now. Uh, the reality and is- And I understand that, that they, Diane. Count those seconds. Um, I, I, the reality is that the, um, the state is in deep negotiation with the superintendent. No one I think quite knows what that deal is being cut. It seems the same old people, right? The same folks that were anti-BPS years ago are back. The question was what we've been doing. So let me just say that. I've been representing the Boston branch NAACP uh, in the negotiations around both getting the elected school committee, home rule petition done, but a part of yes on three. I was representing the same branch on the exam school issue. And still now we are in a fight around the receivership, the, the superintendent search and the receivership. We are scheduled to meet with the mayor next week on Thursday morning. And so we will have some conversation about those issues. The 
the, the process is moving. The state has not done well by any state. They've taken any school system, they any of the three systems that are now in receivership um, in this administration. Why anyone would think that this administration would be a right place to take over a school system that is the majority children of color when they can't even find a one single black secretariat in five years makes no sense to me. They do not know what they're doing. They are the worst place for us and we should be having that conversation on the streets because I think there's a deal being with our with our with the mayor right now. Thank you. Liz, where do you fall on state takeover of BPS? Totally against receivership, I believe it's anti-democratic and I actually think it denies black and brown families and parents participation in the issue. You're right, Diane, that the state is the worst place because the state does not understand urban or gateway cities. Um, they haven't and they've shown that time and time again over the last hundreds of years of our educational system here in Massachusetts, which was first in the nation. Our Boston public schools have a resource problem. There are 50,000 or so students in our school system. When I was a Boston public school student, even at an exam school, there were persistent achievement and opportunity gaps that still exist today. And the issue is that we have not invested, not at the state level, not at the federal level or the municipal level in our schools. And even though the Student Opportunity Act was passed in 2019, we still need progressive taxation and other forms of money to support our public educational system. I represent a district with 17 schools. I visited all multiple times. Many of them are full of ELL learners or special needs students, and they're still not getting what they need. So receivership is not the answer uh, to this problem, fully funding our schools and ensuring that parents, students, and educators are at the table to make the decisions for our school system is what we need. Thank you. Anika, where do you fall on state takeover of BPS? Uh, as I said publicly, and I think was quoted in the Globe, uh, Commissioner Riley needs uh, to keep his hands fully off my district in all districts. I think that the state needs to uh, go back and revisit what we did uh, in Ed Reform um, about a decade ago, and we need to, to ban receivership. It doesn't work not only in Massachusetts, it doesn't work anywhere in the country for all the reasons that have been stated here. You talk about what's the daylight between the candidates. So let me lay it out like this. When we did the Student Opportunity Act, it was really critical to not only know that it needed to be done, but how specifically it needed to be done. So I dove into that data, I understood. And when I met with then Speaker DeLeo, he actually asked me questions like, well, what do, you, what do you mean by uh, decile? <laughs> what do you mean by, that, mean, that means the, the, the poorest school district. Uh, what do you mean by uh, how you define kids in poverty? Some of these basic things, we can't rely on the fact that our leadership understand them. As Rep. Miranda said, not only do people not only understand, they don't understand the data sometimes that's been presented. And so I get that information from uh, the BTU. I get that information from my uh, district leaders. And when I met with Commissioner Riley, I came armed with Principal uh, uh, Katie Arasa from the Curly. I came armed with the data that she gave me. And so taking the voice into, from the district into uh, the halls of power is a really critical way of making this point. We have to keep doing that, but we also have to use the law to protect our districts. Thank you, Nika. And, uh, and I'm coming back with three more rapid fire questions. The order is going to be Diane, Liz, Nika, and then <clears throat> Um, First question, do you support granting in-state tuition and financial aid to undocumented students? Yes. Liz? Yes. Nika? Yes. Nika? Yes. yes. Okay, and, and Minyard? Yes. Um, Next question. Do you support same day registration to allow voters to register or update their registration at the polls on election day and during the early early, early voting period? Diane? Yes. Liz? Yes. Nika? Yes. Minier? Yes. Last question. Would you support eliminating these exemptions of public records laws for the legislature, judici judiciary, and governor's office. Would you support eliminating um, the exemptions to, uh, of, of eliminating exemptions of public records laws for the legislature, judiciary, governor's office? Um, this is the only state in which this happens. Diane. Yes. 
Liz. Yes. Nika. Yes. And Minyard. Yes. Um, Great, thank you. Our next question will begin with Liz. How do you propose addressing the wellness and mental health challenges facing our residents of all ages? What are your priorities and what specific policies would you pursue? You know, I'm a firm believer that when you don't live in a healthy community, when you're not safe, when you're not emotionally well, none of the other things that we talked about tonight really matter. And it's important that after COVID-19 in particular, everyone is struggling. No one is immune to not only mental health challenges, to isolation, to the public health crisis. Our communities, particularly the second Suffolk, have some of the worst social determinants of our health. And that's why I'm centering health equity as part of my plans for the second Suffolk. And, you know, my first year, you know, I talk a lot about the stress that I went through, uh, the trauma that I went through. I'm still mourning and in grief and deep grief over the loss of my brother, my my grandmother and my father during my time in office. And that is an important piece. And that's why I started Project Crenshaw in my district in year one to use the digital platforms of Instagram and Facebook to ensure that people got the mental health resources they need. There's a problem of affordability. There's a problem of accessibility, but we also uh, have a problem, sorry, I'm a little nervous, uh, about providing culturally competent care. This is an issue that I care deeply about. Four months ago, my brother was incarcerated in the DOC system and he recently was released. He had deep mental challenges and finding him a provider as a black man was very hard, but thankfully we had Fathers Uplift in our community that helped save him. And we need more Fathers Uplift programs and programs like that for our community across the district. Thank you, Nika, you go next. Any priorities or specific policies you pursue for addressing wellness and mental health challenges facing Massachusetts residents? I want to expand the priorities I've already come to with actually before COVID, I sat with the chair of Ways and Means because he called me up to ask me some questions as he does from time to time with different ones of us about uh, what to do with the surplus, uh, one of the surplus budgets. And I said, we need to put more behavioral health for children, particularly uh, running that through public housing. He put millions extra in public housing. He put millions extra uh, in behavioral health for children. I wasn't the only one asking for that. I'm not trying to take all the credit, but I did my part on behalf of us. And in fact, that's why he invited me to file that $1 million amendment that those kids helped me get where half of that money did go for public health related things in, um, in public housing. Uh, but I come at this personally, my own sister uh, is bipolar and I took her and her four children in uh, after they lost their father to gun violence and they each had their own various series of trauma. And so when I, when I speak, I speak authentically, not only from my district experience, but from my personal experience. We have to make sure that there's sufficient funding for behavioral health in every school. Uh, the Student Opportunity Act uh, that doubled low-income school district funding, that's only what was required for basic level of education equity. It doesn't include what's needed for social workers. It doesn't include what's needed for nurses. It doesn't include what's needed for public, for behavioral health. Right now, there's no particular entity in the state that is responsible for the behavioral health of kids in schools. So we've got to fix that. And on time, thank you. Minyard, you are next. Thank you, Soraya. I think one of the things that's interesting about the question that you raised is that we have mental health in the community that goes undealt with. And we see it in our houses of faith over and over where folks come into the church, they have mental health issues, they want prayer, uh, and we do give them that, but there's more than they need in many of the cases in prayer. And as a state senator, I would propose that we look at the state budget. Uh, we take state money, we give it to a Whittier Street Health Center, we give it to a Harvest Street Health Center, we give it to a Mount Bolden Health Street Center, so they can bring in the mental health professionals as part of the health services that they now provide. Because it's amazing how the uh, mental health of our community goes unnoticed and really undealt with. Solomon Carter Fuller Center years ago did a great job in providing mental health. Many folks would refer them to Solomon Carter Fuller 
But one of the things we did years ago with Emmanuel Gospel Center, because we had so many folks coming into the houses of faith with mental health issues, we put together a referral booklet that allowed us to refer those that came to the church that needed referrals outside of the church to the different mental health facilities. And I think we need to take some of that state money. I think we need to give it to these health centers. And I think they can add a different component to, re to giving health to folks because it's not just physical health that they should be doing. It should also be mental health. And I think that's a proposal that uh, as state senator, I would propose and act on. I think it gets to the heart of the problem. And I think we need to hear from Diane before we move to the next question. I just want to talk about what, what, we, what, what we are doing now, um, in part because when our children finally got to go back to school after almost 15 months of uh, isolation, um, there was never a plan in BPS that provided mental health support. In fact, most of you know, not only that, but the police were gone. And so it was a really dangerous combination. And we're seeing every day the result of those two like bad decisions. So we went to the New England um, Medical Association, which for those of you who are not familiar, it is the New England chapter of the National Medical Association, the oldest black profession for physicians. And we are working with them on putting together a mental health, a comprehensive mental health program we use the talent of the people who are trained in this area to, um, to provide a, a, a level of mental health service so you can get it. And not only as Reverend Culpepper said, not only in our community health centers, but where people visit, where people are going to, where they converse, whether it is our community health centers, our churches, it could be some of our school buildings, but it's not just for the children. Our families, our adults, our seniors are suffering from the iso from mental health issues around isolation. And so we're looking at um, a, a, whole, a whole and comprehensive. We also have neighborhoods where, that are suffering more than others, but there's certainly a, a plan in place and working with Councilor Fernandez Anderson in particular, who is leading this effort around Roxbury and D7. I was muted. Thank you, Diane. Um, we're gonna for this next question. We're going to ask you to fill in the blank. So please complete the blank in the following question. We're gonna start with Nika. So please complete the blank in the following question. I am the only candidate in this race who puts the leadership of others before my own leadership. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. And also, this is not a, a lightning question either. So you, if you want to go. Oh, on, I can on. say stuff. Oh, yeah. I've been filling the blank. I thought I was supposed to do one word and I was cheating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are, I, I trained and, uh, and developed a leader. We have 90 seconds, right? I need my timer sure. going. <laughs> um, I've trained and developed leaders for a profession. I've studied leadership at Harvard and MIT. I've um, uh, studied leadership even in my law school courses. And I've, I've been the mentor and the mentee of, of, of great people, some well-known, some not known at all, including those at Emmanuel Gospel Center, I have mentioned by my colleague there, uh, where I worked and was on the board for a long time. One of the key things that you learn as a systems thinking trainer around the world that's universal is leaders who build leaders who build leaders get movements done. A movement leader can never put their own notoriety uh, or putting themselves forward ahead of anything else. But what I do know is that there are, are three other very strong leadership models in this room. I've studied leadership and I know what each of your leadership models are. Uh, they're excellent uh, ways of leading in different settings. But the particular transformational leadership that allows transactions to happen, but transactional leadership, when you're, when you're bringing in money or when you're making a decision on behalf of somebody is, a, is an avenue to building their leadership and to bringing them to the forefront. I have the skill set to do this, the knowledge, because I've done it many times with many leaders, uh, but I've also been doing it for the last three years. And so when Leslie Cradle came to me and said, we need to house people who are formerly incarcerated, uh, we drafted a bill to dismantle the structural racism in the law the same way that it was built in. We got voucher money in there uh, to the budget. We got $100,000 to set off a pilot. And now we got this bill moving through the housing committee. That's one of many examples. Thank you, Nika. Um, Minier, please complete the blank in the following question. I am the only candidate in the race who 
who has 27 years of housing experience, fighting for housing justice, uh, putting folks in housing. And a good example, and let me just piggyback on what Nika said about leadership. Leadership is putting folks in housing. And so what we did, you heard me mention the demonstration disposition program was with Academy Homes, for example. We demolished Academy Homes. We built it brand new. The tenants didn't pay a penny. We built it back brand new. We transferred it to the tenant association. The tenant association now owns Academy Home. That's stabilizing housing. We did the same thing with Canfield Gardens in the South End. It's not Canfield Gardens anymore because Canfield Gardens was demolished it. We demolished it under the demonstration disposition program. We built it up brand new. We transferred ownership to the tenant association. When you drive down Seaver Street, you'll see the apartments right across from Franklin Park. They were once Franklin Park. Their name has now been changed. We renovated it. We transferred ownership to the tenants. And I think one of the interesting things about dealing with gentrification, because I think it's something we need to talk about that we're gonna to have to deal with, is how do you come up with solutions to stabilize the housing of folks that are now being faced with uh, living in a city where the rents and the home ownership, the taxes, everything is just sky high. I think you come up with solutions. We would take, for example, let's say Lenox Street. If you look at Lenox Street, it's right next to Camfield Estates. We would do the same thing. We would have a state demonstration disposition program that transferred ownership to the You're tenants. Right. And we. Thank you. Um, uh, Diane. Please fill in the blank. I am the only candidate in this race who who has who has actually been an effective state senator for the second cycle district. And by that I mean this. Um, we are the only state in the United States that has a community reinvestment act for the insurance industry. That was my bit. We were the first state in the nation that had a racial and gender profiling data collection bill to collect data on women being stopped. That was my bill. I, I sponsored the birth control pill bill. Most people don't even recognize that the, one of the questions we were asked, um, women who worked before 2000 had to go into their pocket, worked and had insurance, had to go into their pocket every month and pay for their birth control pills because it was not covered in 2000. Viagra was introduced on the market in 1986 and 40 years later, 76% of the state insurers were covering Viagra by 2000. That, that's, that's, that, that's the ridiculousness of uh, 1996, of, of the process. And so I could, convention center bill, uh, the highest number of people of color, women, businesses, and any state public pro contract was that bill. I wrote the language. I don't know if Vineyard knows this, but I wrote the application with Gunny Branch and Carolyn Gibson for the demo dispo project that he talks about. And we had as a requirement that it had to be turned over and it was going to be tenant centered, tenant run. And so, and that we were going to have 50% um, minority and women business contracts in that process. And so I wrote the, the, the public construction, Bill co-authored with our now secretary of labor. Uh, so there is, that's it. I, I have a master's in organizational leadership, 2015 and including a JD. And I'm proud of that, but clearly that is it. The record speaks for itself. Thank you, Diane. Liz, please complete the following question. I'm the only candidate in the race who has a lived experience, the progressive track record for legislative victories, and has the grassroots acumen. Uh, and I haven't been an effective state senator yet, but I've been an effective state representative. In the last three short years, I've delivered on five bills on all the key issues that helped to end mass incarceration, uh, centering environmental justice communities, re-enfranchising eight to 10,000 of our brothers and sisters who are incarcerated that look like everyone on this stage, and also elevating the issue of reproductive maternal care and birthing justice centered on black women. And I know that I'll be an effective leader in the state Senate. We are going to move on to our closing statements now. Minyard, you will begin. You have two minutes. Thank you, Soraya. Thank you, Yahoo. 
And thank you for the JP progressives for giving us the opportunity to be heard tonight. You've obviously heard a lot from us tonight. Uh, I believe that I have the lived and underground experience, the leadership, and the commitment to be an effective state senator for the residents of the second Suffolk district. I bring to this uh, state senate uh, a new voice, new leadership. Uh, I am the housing candidate and I will be the housing senator. If elected, I will go to work every day to fight on your behalf and deliver real results for our community. I have been endorsed by Representative Royal Boland Jr., the son of the former state senator. I have been endorsed by uh, Bruce Boland Jr., uh, the son of the former city councilor. I have been endorsed by uh, Bill Owens Jr., the son of the former state senator in this seat. And uh, I would love the endorsement of the J Jamaica Payne progressives. Thank you for your time. Uh, giving me an opportunity to speak to you tonight. And if you want to learn more about my campaign, my campaign, please go to culpepperforsenate.com. Again, thank you for the opportunity. And I look forward to discussing the issues more in the coming days. Thank you so much, Diane. You have two minutes for closing statements. If any of you who have, all of us who have been watching what's happening on the national level, you know that we are going to have to brace ourselves and they're going to be in for a ride. Um, women's rights are at stake. Voting rights are at stake. Um, gay marriage is at stake. All of the things that so many of us hold near and dear. Um, I've been through that battle. Oh, time tested. Uh, gay marriage on, on the floor, that debate. I've been through the, the, some of the toughest times in this district. And I, and I am very clear that the things that we were able to do, you know, before 2008, the things that I, that I did and paid a price for it that harmed a lot of people in the district. And for that, I will be forever, ever, forever, forever regretful and sorry, um, because I think we lost, we all lost. Um, and so I, I make no, uh, no bones about what I'm asking people to do. But I also know that if you are concerned about women's rights, if you are concerned about what happens with voting rights, uh, gay marriage, uh, LGBTQ marriage, you know, LGBTQ issues, then um, you're not gonna have a better advocate in this next two to four years for this battle than I. There is no one who has the record of working through controversial, tough issues and delivering and representing a district that is as diverse as this. That is my pride. It's one of the reasons why I have been so so happy and blessed because the folks from the South End, Copley, Back Bay, Beacon Hill, Roxbury, Dorchester, JP will all say she paid attention to us. That's, that's, that's not an easy thing to do, but it's an, an obligation that when you take on a district that is as diverse as this one. I would be proud to serve. Uh, and I hope that you would um, uh, consider uh, giving me that vote. And I'm looking forward to the next several months and having this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. You have two minutes for closing statements. I'm a firm believer that leadership comes from a place of love. And when you don't love a community or understand it and don't have the lived experience, of understanding that community, you can't be an effective leader for everyone. And I feel like I will be an effective leader for everyone. Growing up in the Dudley Triangle, I learned a lot of things at the age of 13, being involved in Nubian Roots and the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. I learned that people, even if they didn't have the means, even if they couldn't speak the language, even if they were uh, formerly incarcerated, still had the power. And this race, I believe, is about the people. And I want anyone that's listening right now is that I'll be focused on you, your family, and the things that keep you up at night, because this is about our community and our city, and this is our fight. People to people, community to community, hood to hood, block by block, brick by brick. My agenda has been centered on equity and justice since day one. I fought on all the issues that are important to black and brown communities. And this is a diverse community. It's a beautiful tapestry of many cultures, including the black diaspora. Um, 
coming together to fight for what is right and fighting for what their community is. I wanna end by saying that in three short years that I've been in the State House three and a half, we went through a global pandemic. We went through a housing crisis. We went through an economic crisis where jobs just disappeared. We've all had to go through this together. And the only way we continue to elect people that are representative, not only to fight for the legislative priorities that we want, not only to bring resources to our community, but to also champion the causes that the state is not talking about, like birthing justice, like talking about ending mass incarceration, which is a very important issue in our community, but also centering environmental justice. We are sick. Our communities have been blighted for decades, and we need to center making sure that we're healthy, we're safe, and we have communities full of opportunity. And I'll bring that to the second session. Thank you. And Mika, you have two minutes for closing statement. Thank you. And again, thank you to JP Progressives and to you, Soraya, Soraya and to Yahoo. Uh, listen, we don't want just a brilliant bureaucrat, which is so important. We don't want just a seasoned, uh, experienced leader. We don't want just a brilliant tactician. We want someone who can do all three. I have experience in all three, 30 years of experience in all three, throughout the city, throughout the state, running two statewide programs, and even in other countries. Talk about intractable problems. I've stood with shooters and tried to help them de-escalate. I've stood on garbage piles in India and tried to help people come across caste under the leadership of their indigenous leaders who were training me. I know what it means to build a movement in intractable circumstances. And I'm not here because I'm a great leader. I'm here because you're great leaders. You need to be empowered. The state is talking about mass incarceration, but they're not talking about it in the right way. The, the, the state is talking about ending youth violence, but they're not talking about it in the right way. Because we know that as a research basis, and I know this because I spent 15 years studying the problem of youth violence, the jobs, small business opportunity, entrepreneurial opportunity decreases youth violence. Taking guns off the street does not do that. We need to people that will bring your knowledge and understanding from the district into the state house, into the halls of power at the executive branch, into the halls of power at city hall, so that I'm not your superstar, you're the superstars and you're making other superstars. This is what we need right now. I could be doing anything anywhere in the world. Most of us actually have that background. And yes, we all have the lived experience. We've lost people, we've lost health, and we've persisted. But you know what? This district, just like me, is not defined by our suffering. We're defined by our victories. And so I want economic opportunity, housing justice. These are the racial issues we need to take on. Indigenous agenda, anti-Blackness, these are the racial issues. We will not be defined by our suffering and our poverty. We will be defined by our investment and by de demanding a return on that investment and, and, and leading the state. Great, thank you so much to our candidates. And I think that we will have a member of the JP Progressives close us out. Um, obviously the second topic will be well represented. And good luck to all of you. Hi everybody, I'm Krista Magnuson. I'm one of the JP Progressives co-chairs. That's uh, my duty to close us out tonight. So just, we wanna take a moment to say thank you again to all of our candidates for taking the time to be here with us tonight to share their vision and their thoughts about uh, what should happen in the second Suffolk. We wanna especially call out our moderators. Thank you, Yawu, thank you, Soraya. Um, your, your shepherding us through this process was incredibly helpful and lovely and we appreciate the time and, and the effort in being here tonight. And we wanna make sure we thank our partners, uh, Boston Branch NAACP, Mehente, uh, Chinese Progressive Political Action, and Right to the City Vote. Um, they help us formulate the way we're gonna do this and it's important for us to all be working in coalition together. So next steps, uh, we have an endorsement process. This is the sort of you know beginning of it. We have a community conversation coming up for our JP Progressives community that will be May 31st. That is also via Zoom. Uh, I believe we're gonna grab the uh, link to sign up for that and put that in the, uh, yeah, there we go. Ruben's got things for us to do. Um, we have that endorsement conversation coming up in our community. We will be discussing the results, you know, how people are feeling about not just this race, but about the governor, lieutenant governor, 
attorney general, auditor, and the 15 Suffolk race. We have a lot to talk about. So, uh, you know, come prepared. Um, additionally, our 15th Suffolk State Rep Forum is next Tuesday, this May 24th, again, via, via Zoom. So we'll have all the candidates there for that in very similar format to this with our same partners. And we're really looking forward to hopefully seeing many of you there as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank you all so much for your participation. Thank you for those of you who showed up to, to you know, take a moment, uh, spend some time getting to know what this race is about and what the stakes are and who we have as players in the field. We are excited to have all of you participating in the civic process as well. And that's it. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for this time and have a lovely rest of your evening. <laughs>